Good evening from New York. I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Journeys. Welcome to another evening with us. I am going to get right into it and bring on the Honorable Minister of Telecommunication Tourism, uh, which is Catherine Hughes. Kathy, welcome again to CWS Journeys. Thank you, Selwyn. Thank you. It's good to see you looking so smart and bright. Um, a, it, it says a lot to, to the character, knowing how very demanding your job is. It's pressure. It's stress. <laughs> well, it takes a lot of pressure to forge a diamond, right? Yes. The, the last time you sat down with me on CWS Journeys, you were a Guyana member of parliament, member of the opposition, but you're now the minister of government, minister of uh, telecommunication and tourism. What is it like sitting on this side of the aisle? Oh, it's, um, it's a combination of uh, still excitement uh -huh. and the possibilities and the things that I hope that we will achieve. Um, a bit of trepidation because it's a new ministry of public telecommunications. And before that, tourism was also a new ministry. So it is um, developing structures, um, organizational charts, a vision of what you hope to achieve. And um, it's also different in the sense that it's, it's, it's a, the other side of the development issue, so to speak. It's one thing to see it from the opposition side, but um, when you get into government, there are uh, additional challenges, some of them worse than you anticipated, when you were in opposition. And I find personally that everything you attempt to start to do, there are about 10 to 12 other things you need to do before you can get to that task. But um, I'm up for the challenge and I think this administration is also. You know, saying that you're up for the challenge, uh, I mean, that is so very encouraging. And I'm wondering, when you got a Ministry of Tourism, it was a new ministry, and now Ministry of Public Telecommunication, not a new ministry. What is it you believe in your quiet moments? You believe, is it about you that um, the, 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 the government or the president realized or, or <laughs> felt comfortable giving you these new ministries? <laughs> you know, can I be honest? The thing that comes to mind is a glutton for punishment. <laughs> You know, we have that curve. But um, on a serious note, um, maybe one of the challenges is that I can't say no. But um, I, you know, as a person, I think I always, I've always uh, looked at the glass as being half full and not half empty. And I love a challenge. And therefore, to me, public telecommunications, when the president said, hey, you know, this is an area we need to do more on. We are missing um, some steps here. Can you do this? I, I, I felt I had to say yes. Mm. And I'm committed to giving it my best. What was it like your first day on the job? Not in this new portfolio, but when the government took over and you turned in for work the first day. What was that like? Well, you know, I'll tell you a little story. The very first day I should have reported to work I don't know whether it was exhaustion over everything, but I came down with a terrible flu. So oh. I, I really could not make it the day I was supposed to be there. So I'm in this awkward situation. I call the ministry and, you know, I say, okay, let me ask for the permanent secretary. So the person that answers the phone says, here's my voice. And all I hear is minister, minister, is that you? <laughs> I'm laughing because I don't I haven't even met anybody at the ministry yet. This is just a phone call to say, guys, I'm not feeling well. I'll be in a couple hours late. And um, there was one, that was my first introduction, and the conversation went something like, Minister, we waited for you. <laughs> We're so happy you coming to this ministry. And um, you know, the rest is history because I am lucky I went into um a team of really, really great people. Um, some of my uh, assistants in the tourism department, I said to them, look, if I had interviewed you, I would have hired them. 
So um, it's, a, it's a group of crea uh, creative and committed individuals. So I have gotten only support mm -hmm. from the people around them. And I think we've been able to infuse each other. And so we've got a team that wants to deliver. This new portfolio or ministry that you have, what surprised you the most when you took over? Well, I'll tell you the truth. I was surprised I was asked to do this. Um, I know in terms of my skills, there's, a, there's an obvious um, alignment, but I suppose I was just thinking tourism. So it appeared to come um, out of nowhere for me. Um, but in terms of what surprises me, uh, you know, today I'll give you a classic example. I met uh, a group of 12 innovative young Guyanese. They're all in the age group of 20 to, um, I would say, not more than 25. And they have created the most remarkable app that will just uh, blow your mind away. And so when we talk about what surprises me, every day I am encouraged because I interact with real Guyanese that are doing great and remarkable things and just need a little support, either financially for their venture or from the government in terms of creating an enabling environment that they can, um, you know, uh, explore and achieve all that... Uh, they're destined to, to be and to achieve. So I'm always surprised by the potential that is available. Although in the past, I've always thought of potential as a bad word in Ghana, mm -hmm. but that surprises me. What comes to mind when you, you think of, or you envision telecommunications in Guyana in, in 20 or 25 years? Well, um, first of all, I, I, I see uh, the consumer, the, the Guyanese um, person, being able to do business more just from the, the click of a computer. Uh, here I'm talking not about ordering things online and those kinds and, and communications, but certainly in terms of government services, that more and more one would not need to go to a license office to collect, to apply and to collect a driver's license. One would not need to go to the register of births and deaths uh, to get a birth certificate, that everything could be done by, um, by the internet with technology that is currently available. And I think by 2025, there's even more strides that the world will make. And therefore, I see us being able to not make the same mistakes, but I feel confident that we should be able to look at best practices in many parts of the world and determine what would work best for us. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of education, I'm very strong on education in terms of what uh, e-distance learning can do for the development of Diana. And therefore, the challenge we have now where students are are at a disadvantage given their physical location when it comes to education. And here I mean that if you're at a school, let's say in Sarama or Anai, you definitely have less opportunities with the range of teachers. You have less opportunities in terms of books, materials, access to the internet, connectivity. Um, you are limited because of your geographical uh, location. And I hope that by then, those barriers would have been removed by the technology we are able to employ. Mm -hmm. um, then there's, this, the, there's a matter of uh, a question of cost. And of yeah. course, cost is right within that gap, that divide between the, the digital haves and the digital have-nots. Um, how do you see this gap closing, closing or, or, or a bridge being built against this divide? between the digital haves and digital have not Because if only part of the country can consume this amazing new technology, um, then Diane is really not making any sort of progress. Are there much plans in place for this? Well, let me, let me give you an idea. I mean, I've given you the uh, ideal scenario 
um, a few years down the line, but it means starting off by creating the right environment. And what do I mean by that? I mean that um, to start off the whole uh, program of re liberalizing our telecoms market. Mm -hmm. is, um, as you know, we have uh, one key uh, player that uh, op uh, operates and has a, a, a monopoly uh, contract, so to speak. And I'm happy that they have said that they are willing to negotiate and to, to give that up. Uh, because we need to get more players in the market. We need to uh, make it financially uh, possible for new players to be attracted to the concept of carrying telephone service, uh, interconnect access to remote areas in the country. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can continue to do it with just one main operator and another operator in the mobile cell phone service. So we have to free up the market. I think once we open up the market, there'll be it's an opportunity for businesses to come in. I can see other local companies too deciding that there's a specific geographical area that they may need to or may want to get into to provide services. And of course, this is based on the premise that it would be a financially uh, viable and exciting project for them. Nobody gets into business just for the um, a social aspect of it, but there must be returns on your investment. And so I think if we start to uh, change the environment, then you can get more competition, more players. And then I think there's a possibility of really delivering to a wider cross section of the country. We have a lot of remote hinterland communities that still have little or no access. And um, the other thing is that once we create the environment, you know, we are lucky that we have the opportunity with uh, funding through the GRIF Fund to be able to, and the e-government unit has already designed an arrange, uh, array of projects that is geared towards um, accessing finance to develop sustainable projects that will impact those communities. So we're looking at the sustainability also mm -hmm. of the specific projects that can build on the environment we hope to create. And any, um, any initiative to encourage uh, or facilitate partnership between the government and the private sector? Yes, of course. I mean, a lot of what I'm talking about, we hope that the private sector will come on board. Mm -hmm. uh, the private sector is already very, very involved with the provision of internet services in terms of ISPs and, and, and other uh, supporting uh, business streams and e-commerce. Um, so the private sector is a very, very important part in that, uh, in, in that equation for sure. You mentioned this app that um, fascinated you by these young people. Uh, I'm, I, I imagine that in your position, you come across a lot of proposals and, and uh, presentations about, you know, um, technology ideas and telecommunication ideas without giving away the the if you can share with us you don't have to say who or what but one idea that you see is quite promising that can be quite transformative for guyana um well you know in terms of the ict sector uh -huh. um the 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 concept of creating hubs well, first of all, there's, there, there's several areas. One of the things that I, can, I think that will be quite uh, transformative is just recently I got a proposal from a company and they have uh, a, literally, it, it is, it, it's creating an ICT hub. It is also, um, imagine that in our hinterland remote areas where we don't have electricity. Mm -hmm. It's blending the solar technology so it looks almost as a series of floodlights that you can place in communities to provide for start electricity and light to specific areas. But then this hub is designed with solar technology so it also can incorporate the internet connectivity and also it incorporates the opportunity for you to carry uh, a television signal 
And so when you think about it, you've got literally what looks like uh, a garden lamp that will provide light, that will provide internet uh, within a specific geographical area uh, around this hub and also be able to provide uh, television that can be retransmitted from uh, our traditional city and some of our, our regions that are allowed the television signal. So for me, to use solar technology, to have developed the technology so it's at a competitive price, that the government can even start to say, guess what? We could purchase a few of these for, a few, for some of the key um, centers, uh, population centers across the country. That in itself is, is transformational, I think. What, what, what would you say, if you, if you can share with us, um, excites the president about uh, telecommunication? What aspect of it? I think the, pre the president is very strong on uh, young people. Uh, he, I know he wants to do more for them. He is extremely concerned that uh, currently there are not enough opportunities for them to develop them, themselves, their entrepreneurial uh, desires and opportunities. And therefore, I think he wants to see us come up with things that are out of the box. And that's the beauty about young people. They don't think in the traditional conservative way. They never ever come to you and say, oh my goodness, I don't think that could be done. Or we've always done it this way. You know, shouldn't we continue doing it this way? Um, young people are, are experts at the technology. They have grown up with it. They are developing new aspects of it. And they're uh, adjusting it for our needs. So they automatically think out of the box. And their agenda is to do what has not been done. And furthermore, they're impatient, which I love. Which means that they don't want to do it in five years' time or in four years' time. They've got the know-how and they want to do it tomorrow. And, um, well, one of the things I, you, you gave me an opportunity to mention is that... Um, I've decided to start a, a new series come Sunday called Guyanese Youth in Business. And um, because I believe, I personally believe that we should give them a platform to showcase their entrepreneurial endeavors and, and so on. And, and who knows what, can, what that can evoke. Um, perhaps someone may be able to help them to find markets or seed funding, seed money, or whatever the case might be. But that starts on, sun on Sunday. So I'm glad to hear that the president is really keen on pushing the youth into that environment. Th that you mentioned entrepreneurship, the minister... Uh, Selwyn, yes? I just want to compliment you on that idea and that concept for a program because um, it is very necessary. I think it can be very successful. You know, one of the things that I hear all the time is that I know, and this program is reaching a large number of people in the Guyanese diaspora. And there's so many people in the diaspora that want to get involved and they want to do something. And yet, quite often, we're not able to match that desire with a specific need. And therefore, I think a program like this will bring to light the, the array of um, new ideas, the projects, the businesses that are there, that are being developed as we speak, but people just don't know about it. And therefore, I think there's an automatic synergy that can, can take place. So I, I compliment you on, on, on that step. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the Minister of State, uh, Honorable Joseph Harmon, was on the show, and he was talking, one of the things he said is that the government is pushing um, entrepreneurship and working towards developing the necessary infrastructures and policies to faci facilitate that. Um, yeah. Do you want, what is your take on, on, on that effort by the government? I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. And you know, here as a Guyanese, and I'm including myself in it, in it, I think that we have to be honest enough with ourselves and accept that there have been several opportunities over uh, many years 
that Guyanese traditionally have not taken advantage of. So one of the things that surprised me when I took up this position was that for a long time, I was under the impression that, oh my goodness, there's just no money available. It's hard to go, well, nobody wants to go to a commercial bank uh, for a business venture of the kind we're talking about and, and borrow those rates. But what I found was that when you look at the Small Business Bureau, when you look at funds in the grift funds that are available, mm -hmm. and yet people have not come forward. And here I'm giving you two extremes of the spectrum. I'm giving you an opportunity where at one end, the small business end, somebody can have a, a, an idea and can either get grant funding or can produce a proposal and borrow at really, really attractive rates. And of course, where we're talking about the Griff Fund, we're talking for uh, we're talking about projects that require um, a lot more intensive research, um, project proposals that uh, probably would have to be developed with the assistance of uh, experts in the field, um, larger dollar value projects. But in both ends, not enough people have come forward. So therefore, when we talk about entrepreneurial uh, possibilities, we have to start off by encouraging people to get out of the mindset of, oh my goodness, I'm looking for a job. But how can I create um, an opportunity to develop a business, to develop my own income stream, that makes me independent from that mindset of looking for a job and not finding a job. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot more work. It takes a lot more time. And you have to have a lot of get up and go, which is what I'm hoping we can encourage uh, young entrepreneurs and older entrepreneurs to start doing. Mm -hmm. So I want to see more project documents that can actually be submitted to the range of agencies that are now focusing on providing funding. The other thing too is that we have a lot of um, international organizations, I think immediately of UNDP, UNICEF, um, you know, PAHO, WHO, that are willing to lend, that are willing to provide guidance and information and support, technical support in a wide range of areas. And so we have to be able to take advantage of it. In, in the chat room, uh, Neil Jones asked, does the private sector need permission from the government to come in and introduce new innovative industries or solutions? If yes, um, if yes, that can be problematic as it places force the market and innovative. No, the private sector doesn't need permission from the government. Um, I think the environment, the approach that we have um, tried to promote is that we, we agree. I mean, you know, the analogy and the, the slogan we hear all the time is that the private sector is the engine of growth. And it is. We accept that. And what we want to do is really create the environment. And that's where um, getting into renewable energy, so the cost of providing our, our electricity for businesses, for manufacturing, has got to be more attractive for us, for our businesses to be competitive, especially in a regional area. But really what happens is that if someone in the private sector has a great idea, um, depending on what avenue or what type of project it is, they can start off by going to Go Invest. And I know there's a lot of criticisms that have been leveled against Go Invest in the past, but I'm happy to say that in the uh, tourism sector, we now have a whole range of new incentives that are offered there. Just about three weeks ago, the new director of Go Invest uh, was just hired because Minister Dominic Gaskin spent quite a bit of time looking at how we're going to restructure Go Invest as a real one-stop shop that will make it easy for someone to invest. So um, I'm confident that I can say that no, no permission is required. You come with your idea, and the first place to start off is probably Go Invest, where they'll be able to give you a range of concessions, sit with you one-on-one, -on -one, and help you develop your plan 
and say what's available for you. And um, I think it's a good model. And depending on what area, there are other ministries that have similar approaches. Um, in the chat room, Kocharak said in June 2015, the minister indicated on the Ron Bob Semple program that he would have a diaspora desk at the Ministry of Tourism. What happened to that? Well, let me tell you, we haven't forgotten, and I know it seems that it's, it's been a while, but the diaspora relations, the, the responsibility for the for diaspora, diaspora affairs, actually comes under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That view of diaspora relations is really limited to uh, members of the diaspora that came down on health groups, that came to invest, that uh, we were people, individuals that we were re-migrating to Guyana. And so it had a limited uh, uh, focus. Right now, we have an individual within the, min uh, the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs, um, Ayo uh, Chin. And um, she has actually, uh, she is a Foreign Service Officer. She has served in Brussels and several other areas, and she has been identified as the point person. I have automatically developed a relationship with her. And in fact, just about three weeks ago, we presented to her 23 um, pull-ups. These are, um, you know, the, the pull-ups, the publicity pull-ups that you can actually position at all the embassies and high commission offices overseas that's advertising for our tourism product. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a banner on a stand that promotes what Diana has to offer in the tourism uh, department. And so that was um, the first in a series of uh, steps and discussions that we are having with, with her as to how we are going to shape this uh, unit. The more that I looked at it, the more we realized that we did not want to duplicate in the Ministry of Tourism what the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is already doing. And I'm happy to say that there is a conference in two weeks' time that she will be um, attending. It is a UN-sponsored conference that highlights the impact and the role the diaspora could uh, play in the development of all countries. And I'm happy that she's going to be going there and bringing back some suggestions and recommendations. And so we're looking as to how it is we're going to structure the unit. What, what, what in your experience, um, you realize is one of the most underrated um, feature or, or, or thing about Guyana's tourism or Guyana has to offer um, most people don't know about? Well, I think most people don't know what a beautiful country it is. I mean, I've traveled a lot. And, you know, you, I, I remember going, for example, to um, New Orleans. And the big thing then was, oh, you got to take a trip up, a, up the bayou. You know, and we must, a whole group of us must have spent um, $40 a head to go on this trip up the bayou. And after the first 10 minutes, I was looking, thinking, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> because this was, this was maybe just 50% of what I used to see when I would jump in a boat and go up the Kamuni Creek. <laughs> and, and so when we, when we think of our product, we don't realize the vast potential that we have. So the bayou is water, the, you know, part of the Mississippi. The water looks like the Damra River. And guess what? We've got more flora and more fauna in there, in ours, than I saw. Uh, we have the same uh, caiman, if you want to go in the night and look at the caimans. If you want to look at the birds, um, that's our rivers. When you talk about waterfalls, uh, when you talk about hiking, there's so many places you hike up a trail, but, you know, when you consider you could take three days and hike to Kaichor Falls, and part of that hike takes you 
uh, off cliffs, um, through mountains, up rivers in a boat, and then to the top of the majestic Kaicho Falls. I mean, there's just no comparison. It's like a trek and a trek, a trek and a real trek. So um, I think we just, most Guyanese, because um, you know, 50 years ago, only people involved with maybe mining or uh, hinterland agriculture or the army had an opportunity to travel and to really see the beauty of our country. And so that is something that we've got to sell and promote a lot more.